Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story. 76 years ago, on the morning of Tuesday, June 6, 1944, Operation Overlord began when Allied soldiers invaded the beaches of Normandy, France. Today, we know it better as D-Day. Fast forward to today, and one of the most memorable depictions of D-Day on the screen has to be in the movie Saving Private Ryan. And you guessed it, that is exactly what we're going to be covering on today's episode. To help us separate fact from fiction, I'm excited to be joined once again by historian and author Marty Morgan. Last year, Marty helped us learn more about the true story behind another classic film that depicts the D-Day invasion, The Longest Day. Marty has helped filmmakers and game developers work toward better historical accuracy. For example, he was the military advisor on the video game Call of Duty World War II. He's also led battlefield tours on the beaches of Normandy where D-Day took place and is an author whose latest book is called D-Day, A Photographic History of the Normandy Invasion. Before we get Marty on the line, though, let's set up our game. Now, if you're new to the show, welcome. Here is how this works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, James Ryan was the only of the Ryan brothers to survive World War II. Number two, The battle at the bridge in Rommel did not happen. Number three, there was no use of flamethrowers on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and then by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to get historian and author Marty Morgan on the line to chat about the history behind Saving Private Ryan. Let's start this off on D-Day, June 6th, 1944. In the movie, we find out from some text on the screen that we're at Dog Green Sector, Omaha Beach. And this is where we join Tom Hanks's character, Captain John Miller, and the other soldiers as they're heading toward the beaches and landing vehicles. This is an interesting look at what it might have been like for soldiers as they were nearing the shores. They can't see over the sides of the vehicles. All they can hear are the guns and explosions getting closer. There are splashes from the explosions that rain water down on top of them. Then as it's time to go, we see... The front ramp lowered and the front soldiers are almost immediately mowed down by machine gun fire. Miller starts yelling for his men to jump over the sides, which causes even more problems because as they do, they're weighed down by their packs. Some of the men manage to get out of their gear underwater and make it back to the surface. Others don't. Can you give us a little more insight into the location that we get in the movie of Don Green Sector, Omaha Beach, and these moments up until landing on the beach? Yeah, what they're depicting is the moment of the greatest intensity during the battle for Omaha Beach. I would just mention that Omaha Beach it was really six separate battles, each battle functioning separate and almost entirely autonomous and disconnected from one another for the first half of the day on D-Day. And what the screenplay writer in the movie did was he chose the battle that provided the greatest amount of drama because the U.S. Army Fifth Corps landings in the dull green sector of Omaha Beach, and those are landings primarily carried out by um, two battalions of the 29th Infantry Division, and um, then with a few Rangers thrown in. That is where the entire assault goes entirely wrong. The historical quote that I think most effectively communicates how bad it was there is what happens to A Company of the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Division. A Company landed with 164 officers and men and within five minutes of combat in front of the German resistance master bunker complex at Dalkin Sector. They had suffered 91 killed and 65 wounded. Wow. 
So that literally in the span of five minutes, an entire infantry company was reduced to complete ineffectiveness. And that's a significant detail because the first wave at Omaha Beach consisted of nine infantry companies spread out over the entire length of the beach. And Omaha Beach is five miles wide. Out of the nine infantry companies that conducted that preliminary assault, one of them is destroyed entirely in front of the defenses at Dog Green Sector. How many people overall would have been going? I know you mentioned the number of uh, divisions, but just get a nice a sense of how many people are, are storming the beach. There's this five-mile stretch of beach. How many people were there overall that were involved in the invasion there? Well, if you consider just the first wave, and of course there were far more than just one wave during the day on June 6th, but if you consider just the first wave, nine infantry companies as approaching 1,800 to 2,000 men. They're going up against Germans in basically 13 resistance nests or bunker complexes, and the total number of Germans that were immediately in those fighting positions ready to resist the landings at right after dawn on D-Day, total number of Germans is about 600. So our assault force, even with just the first wave, possesses numerical superiority, but the German defending force was behind concrete and then also um, in positions that were built into terrain so that they had elevation over the battlefield. The bluff at Omaha Beach is about 100 feet tall. German positions were at the water level, and they were on top of the bluff. The effect of the elevation, the use of terrain, and the use of concrete fighting positions functioned as a force multiplier that made it possible for those German defenders to inflict heavy casualties for a brief period of time. A point I love to make when discussing the movie Saving Private Ryan is that you can go just a few hundred meters to the east down the length of Omaha Beach where you're, you're encountering U.S. troops that are landing first wave and they're receiving a little bit of harassing fire at long ranges to where the fire is not entirely effective. Um, in, in other words, you, could, you had Americans that landed that were just a few hundred meters to the east of Dog Green Sector and almost everyone gets out of the landing craft, gets through the beach obstacles and makes it to this thing called the shingle with light casualties that stands in strong contrast to what happens at Dog Green Sector, which is, of course, what's depicted in the opening scene of the movie, where you have effectively cataclysmic casualties. Yeah, the impression I got was that was essentially what was going on everywhere, because, of course, that's the only thing that we see is this just mass rain of of fire as these people are getting out of the landing vehicles. And so I just assumed that that was happening everywhere on the beach, but it sounds like very, very different experiences. That's absolutely correct, because the movie will lead you the impression that it was a five mile wide slaughterhouse. And it simply was not that. It just wasn't that at all. I make the larger macro argument that the depiction of the moment of the greatest chaos and casualties, it sort of fits something that's been going on in the overall narrative of the war movie as a genre in cinema for at least 50 years now. And I argue that the era of Vietnam introduced certain levels of disenchantment and cynicism to the way that Americans comprehend the experience of war. And that the Vietnam era changed the way that we understand war and that we always think of it as being led by fools, being bureaucratically led to the point of producing a m massive ineffectiveness. A point I like to make, too, is that it depicts uh, the, de the victimization of the lowest ranking people. And so, in other words, since the era of Vietnam, we like to imagine fat cat, corrupted, high-ranking officers that are far removed from the experience of fighting on the front, who are planning the battles in which the best and brightest of American youth are slaughtered needlessly on the battlefield. And Private Ryan, I find, is a movie that at its core is very patriotic, which is why it came as such a surprise to me when the movie came out and I caught it for the first time in the theaters. It really felt like a change of gears. Because it's a movie that in the end is very patriotic, very, very romanticized. But at the same time, I find that it selects from some of 
the tropes that really characterize the era of the Vietnam War movie. Interesting. Well, after the soldiers land on the beach, again, going back to the movie, we get a look at how they advance inland. First, there's some metal obstacles that the Germans set up to prevent vehicles from landing on the beach, but they use that as cover. It's not much cover, but it's better than nothing. One of the lines of dialogue as they're getting shot at there kind of struck me as interesting. There's a soldier that yells to Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, says something like, what are your orders, sir? And he replies, get your men off the beach. <laughs> like They had to be told not to just hang out there as they're being slaughtered. The next step of this advance inland here is Barry Pepper's character, Jackson. He's a sniper, so they use covering fire to get him into position to take out the men in the machine gun nest. And then from there, the American soldiers make their way to the German bunker. They use a mixture of grenades and uh, flamethrowers to clear out the bunker. And of course, you know we see the soldiers on the other side tell the other soldiers not to shoot them because they want them to burn up with the flamethrower. After this, we see Captain Miller sit down to survey the beach. And it's just a very high level overview of how the movie shows basically the troops gaining a foothold on D-Day. How accurate is that depiction of how the soldiers advance from their landing craft to establish a foothold? How accurate was that? Let me put it this way. It is the most accurate cinema depiction to date. That's as nice as I can be. Because once you begin to pick this scene apart, like with an advanced course in knowledge uh, in the history of the D-Day invasion, uh, it's hard not to acknowledge the fact that there are some substantial errors in authenticity in the way that the scene is depicted. It feels almost wrong for me to harp on those, and I try to stay away from them as much as possible. But because I believe that the scene, I think that's the most memorable takeaway of the entire motion picture. That whole first 20 minutes of that film is what galvanized everyone. It's what grabs you by the throat and pulls you into that story. It's such an effective moment in filmmaking. And I I remember the first time I sat through it, I mean, it was, it took my breath away. It's such an impactful moment in cinema. With that said, it's got lots of problems. And let's just start with the flamethrower. Don't shoot, let them burn. There is absolutely no use whatsoever of the flamethrower on Omaha Beach on Tuesday, June 6, 1944. So right there, we got a big problem. Because as a person who leads tours, to Normandy many, many times every year and has been doing so for over 20 years. I have basically been doing so in the era since the movie Private Ryan came out because it came out, what was it, July 24th, 1998? It's been almost 22 years since the movie came out. Uh, I've been leading tours during that era. That's sort of something that comes up basically with every tour. And I'm not saying that we did not conduct the amphibious landing without flamethrowers. There were flamethrowers used on D-Day just not on Omaha Beach. They were used in the British and Canadian sectors, for example. With great effect, they were used on um, armored fighting vehicles, particularly with great effect, but not in the American sector and definitely not on Omaha Beach. So the moment that provides a lasting impact for the viewer is built around a core-level historical inaccuracy that I personally have to spend kind of a lot of time dealing with when I'm on the scene on Omaha Beach taking people through the advanced course of what actually happened on D-Day. Because what I'm finding is that people have maybe read a little bit about June 6th. They've watched the movies. They've watched Private Ryan, and they come to Normandy. And it's almost like when they get to Normandy, then the actuality of the learning experience can begin. Again, I feel like Saving Private Ryan did wonders for this subject. I think it created the era where there's an enormous thirst for knowledge about D-Day. It put Normandy kind of back on the map as a tourist destination for Americans. I can speak to that with authority because I might not have that tour guide work were it not for that movie. In other words, if Steven Spielberg had not decided that this was his next passion project, I might be working at the post office. But instead, I spend I get to spend a great deal of time on Omaha Beach every year, and I absolutely love every bit of it. 
And I have to acknowledge and thank the movie Saving Private Ryan for making all of that possible. Um, because these movies really offer such a powerful tool for getting people interested in the subject matter and getting people enthusiastic about the subject matter. So it feels, I feel bad when I harp on things like no flamethrowers on Omaha Beach. Forces landed on Omaha Beach with flamethrowers, but a major moment for the landings of the U.S. Army Fifth Corps on Omaha Beach uh, is that the troops are, for the most part, landed, the troops of the first wave are landed, for the most part, on a sandbar offshore that compelled them, as they waded ashore, to wade through water that got deeper and deeper. You can see this in this famous photograph that was taken by a U.S. Coast Guardsman named Buff Sergeant. And the sergeant photos show a group of men from 16th Infantry Regiment, 1st Infantry Division, landing in front of the Easy Red Sector of Omaha Beach. There's a photograph that shows them on the landing craft right before they land. And then there's a photo of the ramp down in the LCVP. And the men are wading through water that comes all the way up to their chest. That, I think, provides a really powerful piece of evidence as to why things went wrong with things like flamethrowers and also radios. These were pieces of equipment that were never meant to be submerged in salt water, and yet they were submerged in salt water on D-Day, which is why, for the most part, radios and flamethrowers do not work on Omaha Beach. So you've got a big problem there with the flamethrower scene. Something that attaches nicely to the flamethrower point is that the depiction of the bunker from the don't shoot, let them burn moment, that bunker is not something that appears anywhere on the landing area, the 50 mile wide stretch of beaches in northern France where the multinational coalition landed on D Day. There is no bunker like that. Really? There are none, absolutely none. It's a complete falsehood. There are bunkers that look like that that are in the overall german system of prefabricated design but you don't have one like that on omaha beach so that when you see the flamethrower come into the back of the position and then he hits the plane and you see um, a, a hardened position that's on the face of the bluff looking straight out to the water what that looks more like an observation position than anything you don't have that on omaha beach what you have are a series of fighting positions that present a much more modest profile. And when I say that, I mean a profile that's a little bit harder to shoot and destroy. There are basically two types, I should say three types of fighting positions on Omaha Beach. There are fighting positions for heavy weapons, like anti-tank guns, 88mm guns, 75mm guns, 50mm guns. Those positions are, for the most part, oriented not out to sea, but oriented to direct enfilading fire down the length of the beach, and all of them have a traverse wall that protects the embouchure, which is the opening through which the gun points. Then there are a series of fighting positions for automatic weapons. They're much smaller in overall scale, and those fighting positions in some cases do point out to sea, but the Germans also on Omaha Beach had a large number of fighting positions that were uh, basically improvised, meaning they were dug positions that used logs and sandbags to reinforce them. Then you also had positions that concrete underground positions for mortars. And since I just spoke that word, I feel like I should jump ahead real quick and just address one other subject. There's a very arresting moment in that opening scene of Private Ryan where you see an LCVB landing craft on the beach. The camera perspective is over the right shoulder of a German MG42 gunner. And that gunner is just dumping a belt of eight millimeter ammunition straight down through the ramp into the landing craft and slaughtering everybody on board the landing craft. I'm not saying that there's a basic problem with that depiction, but I would say this, it has led people to believe that there were a very large number of MG 42 machine guns on Omaha beach on D-Day. And it has led people to the further misapprehension that the MG-42 was a decisive weapon against Americans landing on Omaha Beach? It certainly was not. That is definitely not what happened. There was an assortment of different types of automatic weapons on Omaha Beach. Not all of them were MG-42s. In fact, the minority of them were MG-42s. And the MG-42, well, I should say this, the MG-42 and all of the other different types of automatic weapons, many of which were foreign, by the way, 
those weapons were far less effective than the opening scene of Private Ryan would have you believe. What that scene be- leads you to believe is that the entire area, everyone's being slaughtered because the entire area is being swept by machine gun fire. And it makes you furthermore think that you're, the entire Omaha Beach area was being swept with machine gun fire from MG42s. There were MG42s. They were the minority of all of the different diverse types of automatic weapons that were there. And automatic weapons fire did not produce anywhere close to the total number of casualties that the actual big killer on D-Day did. And the big killer on Omaha Beach was the German Model 1934 80-millimeter mortar. That weapon does most of the dirty work against American forces landing during those early hours of June 6th. There was a a moment there. I think it was Tom Hanks' character when, I don't remember the soldier's name, that was talking to him, asking him what the orders were. But he made a comment where they've sighted in every inch of this beach. And I'm assuming that was referring to the mortars. Would that be correct? That would be correct. And I should just mention this, that the one cool thing that Private Ryan does is that it borrows from stories from a number of actual living people. Because I can see why Spielberg made the movie the way that he did. And I appreciate the movie that he made. And I like the movie that he made. But he didn't want to make a 100% pure and actuality-based documentary the way that The Longest Day was, for example. He wanted to create a story that he had some freedom to be flexible with, to create circumstances, to create tension between characters. He did the things that storytellers do. And it was all based on the story of Tuesday, June 6, 1944, and a few days thereafter. For the Tom Hanks character, he borrows from a few different people. I'll probably mention them as we continue speaking. But since you mentioned the quote of get your men off the beach, I would just say that in that moment, they borrowed from the story of the man who commanded the U.S. Army's 16th Infantry Regiment on D-Day. His name was Colonel George Taylor. Colonel Taylor, in landing, noticed that there were that the assault toward the beach had largely lost momentum. And the reason that that momentum was lost was because that as men came off of their landing craft, they found that they were vulnerable to enemy small arms fire and, more importantly, in our, uh, fragmentation from enemy mortar fire. The men then moved quickly through the belt where the obstacles were located, and they found that when they reached the beach itself, not, I'm not talking about the water line, but they're reaching the basically the high water line uh, because we landed at low tide as the tide was beginning to come in. And at the high water line on Omaha Beach back then, it's not like this today, but 75 years ago, there was this thing that they called the shingle. And the shingle was rip wraps. They were, they were river rocks about the size of your fist by the millions. They were poured right at the water's edge to prevent scouring of the beach from seasonal winter storms. The shingle will, as a result of wave action, it will sort of take the form of a little bit of a ledge. And there are only two places that I know of today on the overall length of Omaha Beach where there's a little bit of shingle still left. The shingle has largely been removed. So the Omaha Beach that you see today looks quite a bit different than the Omaha Beach did on June 6, 1944. What George Colonel Taylor was finding was that as men came off the landing craft, as they made it up to the beach obstacles, they were being hit by small arms fire and fragmentation from mortars. The men pressed forward from there, and when they reached the shingle, they found that this ledge created in the shingle by wave action provided a degree of shelter. Meaning that when the men reached that ledge at the shingle, that the enemy automatic weapons fire could no longer get to them. And the only way that the enemy could get to them would be to drop mortars in right on top of them. And so what Colonel Taylor noticed was that the men had gotten off the landing craft, gotten through the obstacles, reached the shingle, and then the entire drive inland lost momentum right there. Because the troops had cover. Uh, They had cover and concealment. And... I can't say that I blame those men for, for, for stopping at the point where they were at least out of the small arms fire and the mortar fire. The only problem was that the enemy could then begin dropping mortar fire in on them, and Colonel Taylor realized that, so that when Colonel Taylor came off of his landing craft, as he moved across the beach through the obstacles, and when he reached the shingle and looked around and saw that nobody was moving inland, he realized, okay, we can't stay here. 
because if we stay here, they're going to get us. They're going to stop, start dropping mortar fire on us. And that's where you see the first moment that Tom Hanks's character, John Miller, is inspired by something that was done by an actual historical character, and in this case, Colonel George Taylor. And Colonel Taylor, he provided this quote right then that became memorable and is often cited. And the quote was, there are two kinds of people who are staying on this beach, those who are dead and those who are going to die. Now let's get the hell out of here. And that quote, as time goes by, has has changed and merged a little bit. And to a certain degree, it informs the Captain Miller character's quote when he instructs Sergeant Horvath to get your men off the beach. But there you have a moment where his experience is based on someone who actually survived the Battle of Omaha Beach on D-Day. There will be a few more before the scene's over with. What about the way the movie shows Bangalore's? Because there's a scene there where after the soldiers get off the beach, after Miller tells his men to get off the beach, they make it to a berm in the sand. And then using that as cover, they use Bangalore's, which in the movie look like long metal tubes. They put an explosive in one end and basically they just throw the whole thing over the sand berm. And then a massive explosion later, and the men are able to advance closer to the machine gun nest. And that almost seems like a bit of Hollywood magic there. How well did the movie do depicting those? I don't know if you've seen the movie Samuel F. Fuller's The Big Red One from 1977. Uh, That does not ring a bell. No, I'll have to look that up. If you ever get a chance, have a look at it. it. Samuel Fuller is an actual person who actually lived, who actually wrote this, and he became a filmmaker, and then he made a film that was autobiographical because it was a film documenting his wartime experience in North Africa, Sicily, and then on D-Day. And they have an entire set piece in the D-Day scene where they're talking about the Bangalore torpedo. And it's all extremely negative. And it, and it, it by itself, most people don't remember the film, but they remember the Bangalore torpedo sequence in the film. Because he delivers it in this very Vietnam era, deep cynicism of everything's corrupt. And it's something like the dialogue is something like the Bangalore torpedo was this fiendish invention that somebody, some bureaucrat sitting behind a desk came up with. They thought it was a good idea about how to blow your way through barbed wire. And then it goes on in a, with a similar tone. And it's very negative. And then it depicts like the troops. Nobody wants to come forward to push the Bangalore torpedo through the barbed wire. And it's almost, it's very Vietnam. In that it's sort of a, it's like the officer, you go up there and die. And then the men like, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to be the man that dies. And I believe that that doesn't identify World War II at all. But um, it it heaps a great deal of criticism on the Bangalore torpedo when the Bangalore torpedo was a pretty kick-ass weapon system that was really good at blowing stuff up. And we used it all over the place. We used it not just on beaches. We used it in street battles. We used it all the time. And it was the best way of blowing a big gap through barbed wire entanglements. And that's why for the first wave on Omaha Beach, we had these embedded with the the nine infantry companies. Each each company had what they called a gap team. And the gap teams were equipped with pole charges and Bangalore torpedoes. And the gap teams, their mission was get off the boat, get up to the shingle, get up to the barbed wire, assemble your Bangalores, blow gaps. And they were, for the most part, successful. It's just that it was never anticipated that they would have to assemble Bangalore torpedo segments under fire from the enemy because a bunch of things had gone wrong. The preliminary naval bombardment was supposed to have taken care of the opposition. And then the troops were supposed to land with tank support. And they didn't. And the result was that you had guys trying to assemble Bangalore torpedoes under automatic weapons fire and mortar fire. And so there were casualties and there was a delay in getting the Bangalore torpedoes up and online. But that doesn't mean that the Bangalore torpedo was a bad weapon because each section is nine freaking pounds of Composition B high explosive. And it, was a, and it was not even just Composition B. It was a combination of 80% Composition B TNT and 20% ammonium nitrate. That's right. It's 80-20. 80% TNT, 20% sodium um, ammonium nitrate. And nine pounds of it and that is one hell of a big explosion and it, and it absolutely shredded those barbed wire entanglements on the whole beach so the weapon system is completely successful and so when you see it in private ryan 
luckily they didn't go down the route that they did in the Big Red One, the movie, the Big Red One. But in Private Ryan, you see them, they've gotten the sections assembled, and then you see somebody attach a fuse section to the back end, and then he pulls the friction primer on the fuse and shoves it into the barbed wire. And I wanted to mention it because that is um, a level of, of technical authenticity that I really respect that they did that because they show him do that. And then the explosion that follows that is like an Armageddon, which is what it would have been because consider the standard I mean, the sections that like gap team number 10 on Omaha beach, they, they had five sections connected together where they blew the, their gap. And that's five times nine. That's 45 pounds of high explosive. That would blow the hell out of anything. And I mean, that's, that's why I'm, I, that was a level of authenticity and detail in Private Ryan that I thought was really cool that they depicted that so effectively. And it's a moment that if you blink, you miss it. Would you say it's fair to say that what they did in Dog Green Sector in the movie was basically take all of these different experiences that were happening on D-Day and compress them into as if they all happened in this one location? Would that be a fair assessment? It is a fair assessment. In fact, I would say that what happened there is I live in Louisiana and everything gets compared to a gumbo. It is a gumbo that's everything all mixed together to create a scene that provides the absolute greatest possible tension, suspense, action, and drama. I mean, and that's the sign of good storytelling and therefore good filmmaking. But we should also be careful that when someone tells a story well and provides excellence in filmmaking, we should understand it's not a documentary. Right, for sure. You mentioned the first 20 minutes or so, and it was about 20, 21 minutes or so, depending on where you start and stop, uh, from when the landing craft drops the ramp to when Captain Miller is surveying the beach. How long did it actually take for them to establish that foothold? It changes from place to place. I hate to give you typical historian answers because historians like to qualify things. But I recognize basically six battles for Omaha Beach. And in those six battles, you can mark how in each one of these pods of action, men land, get off the beach, get up to the top of the bluff. And typically the point where we acknowledge that they've reached the end of the line is when they reach the top of the bluff. The first force to make it off the beach to the top of the bluff on D-Day, that was a cumulative period of time of, I'd say, a little over two hours, approaching three which says something powerful about what happened on Omaha Beach. Because the plan was not that we would spend almost three hours bogged down by enemy machine guns and mortars. The plan was that we would land overwhelm the enemy and move quickly into the interior, bypassing the enemy's beach defenses. Because we knew that once you moved beyond the beach and you moved into the interior, the enemy's ability to defend was greatly undermined by density of defensive forces and terrain. In other words, we were not planning to lose a lot of great people trying to punch through the beach defenses, and that's that's what happened. So the first force is up and off the beach, way down at the far left, the far eastern end of Omaha Beach, and that is a force that was led, for the most part, by a lieutenant by the name of Jimmy Monteith. Lieutenant Monteith gets his men off the beach. He actually leads two Sherman tanks up the Cabor draw. They engage in intense action against a German bunker complex at the top of the Cabo draw, the far eastern end of Omaha Beach in the Fox sector, a place called WN60. Uh, and they're up some point between 9 and 9.30 a.m. They're the first off the beach. The place where you get the men, the last group, to get off the beach to the top of the bluff, that's happening in the area of the 16th Infantry Regiment, and the 18th Infantry, that's just to the east of Dog Green Sector. So that by 10 o'clock, basically the entire first wave assault force has achieved the objective of getting off the beach and reaching the summit of the bluff behind the beach. Okay, so it sounds like not only did they compress everything as far as the events themselves, but also the timeline was compressed some as well. Like you said, end of the day, it's not a documentary, but to tell the story. Precisely. Like a, a great example of how 
it's done in another project that's where quite famous is people love to talk about episode two of the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. And in that episode, it depicts this battle at a place called Breakcore Manor, where Lieutenant Dick Winters leads his men in an assault on a German gun battery. And in episode two of the HBO series, that attack unfolds over about a 20-minute time period, when in actuality, the battle at Breakcore Manor goes on for almost six hours during the day on June 6th. Filmmaking requires you to strip down timelines and compress facts. And that process of compression is something that exerted itself on the movie Saving Private Ryan in a powerful way in that early scene. But I would would just say this, um, because as much as I like to go actually, but, and then point out a bunch of obscure facts that nobody cares about, the fact that you do get a scene that is effectively 20 minutes of nothing but uh, combat and action for all of its shortcomings. I would say that there is no living filmmaker on this planet that could get away with doing that except Steven Spielberg. Because any other filmmaker would be under the supervision of studio executives and studio executives one would want the film to conform to a more traditional action movie format. You can look at other movies that came out in the aftermath of Private Ryan, movies that I always like to say live in the shadow of Private Ryan, movies movies that just didn't perform like that film, movies that didn't create the legacy that Private Ryan has created. I think of movies like a movie that I actually really like, The Thin Red Line. It just didn't live up to the Private Ryan legend. The movie Wind Talkers, I think, is a great example. That's a film where... The director was under a lot of studio pressure to conform to certain tropes of what an action movie, what they believe an action movie is supposed to be. And the movie's just, it's not memorable. It's got a lot of problems with it. And it's kind of not a good movie on every level. Private Ryan, on the other hand, when Spielberg sat down to make that movie, he was at a point in his career where he could do whatever the hell he wanted to do. And it's, it's good to be the king. And I'm thankful for that because... Spielberg, he did not have studio executives pressuring him to make the movie that they wanted him to make. He was making the movie he wanted to make, and he wanted that 20 minutes to do something to the viewer. And I think it succeeds magnificently. It throws you in the action, and if nothing else, at the end of it, it makes you want to find out more about what actually happened. If I had to indicate an overall greater good served by the movie that's got some historical accuracy problems... I think you've just identified it, and that is that that movie caused interest and enthusiasm to flicker to life at a time when interest and enthusiasm in the Second World War was dying off pretty quickly. That movie breathed a new breath of longevity into enthusiasm for World War II history, and I just wish that Steven Spielberg would make another World War II movie, because, man, that that gave me 20 solid years of work. I could use another 20. (laughs) <laughs> there you go well it's steven if you're listening to this <laughs> yes um, yeah i know he's listening so Spielberg, get out there and get to work for me there you go. <laughs> all right well speaking of the movie going back to it after the invasion we see these events lead to what is what is the main storyline and the title of the movie saving private ryan and it starts when we see some of the bodies of the soldiers lying on the beach and one of them the camera focuses in on is s ryan From there, we're taken to rows of desks where women are typing away on typewriters. They're writing letters to families back home, letting them know that their loved ones are gone. One of the women notices something, and then before long, she's heading with three letters to one of the offices, and we see some of the names here. It goes up the chain to uh, Colonel L.W. Bryce, to General George C. Marshall, who is the United States Army's Chief of Staff. And then we find out that there are three Ryan brothers who have died. Two of them died at Normandy, one in New Guinea. Colonel Bryce explains to General Marshall that the four Ryan brothers, three of them have passed, but they were all used to be in the same company in the 29th Division. But then when the Sullivan brothers died on the Juno, the Ryan brothers were split up. We don't get a lot more context around that. He just mentions that in a, a line of dialogue there. And then he says that the last one left alive, or maybe he's alive, we don't really know, it's James Ryan, and he's part of the 101st Airborne. He was dropped about 15 miles inland near Newville, which is behind German lines. And then that sets in motion the whole plot of the movie. 
General Marshall pulls out a letter from President Abraham Lincoln addressed to a woman named Mrs. Bigsby in Boston. And after reading the letter, he decides they're going to go on this mission and try to bring Private Ryan home. So that's how the movie sets up this entire mission. How much of that actually happened? All of that is based on effectively two tragic stories. And that's the stories of the Nyland brothers and the Sullivan brothers. It's most closely associated with what happens to the Nylans, because the Nyland brothers' family story has a pretty significant rendezvous with destiny in the Normandy invasion. The Nylans were four brothers, Edward, Preston, Robert, and Fritz. Those four brothers were all serving in uniform. Edward was serving with the B-25 crew in the Pacific. Preston was serving as a platoon leader in the 4th Infantry Division. He landed on D-Day. Bob Nyland was serving in the D Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. And Fritz was serving in the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. The four brothers, their story comes to the significant point on June 6th, and that's because Edward was thought to have been killed in action. His B-25 was shot down and he was captured on May 16th, 1944, right before D-Day. Preston Nyland, who landed on Utah Beach with the 4th Division, was actually killed in action in the fighting in front of the, the Crisbeck Battery, the largest of the German Coast Artillery Batteries in the Normandy invasion area. He was killed in action on June 7th. Bob Nyland, uh, Robert, he jumped in with D Company of the 505th. He was killed in action on June 6th. I mentioned the three of them because Mrs. Nyland was therefore in a position to receive three telegrams informing her of how Edward was missing, Preston was dead, and Robert was dead. Fritz was initially missing in action because when he jumped into Normandy, the experience of scattering of airborne units was such that not everyone reported in quickly. And so there was a period of several days during which Fritz was not even fighting with the, with the 101st. He had it, ended up mixed in with the 82nd Airborne Division, and it, he was therefore carried as missing in action briefly. And so what was therefore potentially going to happen was that Mrs. Mutton Island back in Tonawanda, New York, she's going to receive four telegrams announcing the deaths of her four sons. Although, as it turns out, Edward survived eventually, but Preston and Bob were both killed in action. And for a brief period of time, it looked like Fritz was also missing, just like Edward was. The story is loosely based on that. That story was told, it was a story that was well known before the 50th anniversary of D-Day, but the story was recounted in Stephen Ambrose's book, D-Day, The Climactic Battle of World War II. And it was that book which compiled the stories of a large number of people from the German side, from the U.S. side, from the British side, from the Canadian side. It was that book that Steven Spielberg gave to his screenplay writer, Robert Rodat, and said, I want you to give me a screenplay that incorporates all of the elements that make this book great. And Mr. Spielberg and Rodat both recognized that the Nyland story was powerful. It has some parallels with, and it is influenced by also the story of what happened to the five Sullivan brothers. And those five brothers, George, Francis, Joseph, Madison, and Albert, or Al, those brothers were all serving aboard the Atlanta-class light cruiser USS Juno. And that ship was sunk on November 13th, 1942, during the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal in the Pacific Theater. All five of those brothers were lost with the sinking of the Juno. It was permitted in U.S. Naval Service prior to that moment for brothers, for family members to serve together. In fact, there were fathers and sons serving on board the USS Arizona, for example. And here you have five brothers serving on the same light cruiser. It's lost in action, and all five brothers are lost. They become something that patriotic spirit spirit in the United States in the aftermath of the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal rallies behind. You know, the country begins to recognize that that was an especially precious sacrifice for a family to have made for the war effort. 
and that's why you see you see posters that feature the Sullivan brothers during the war, and the combination of the story of the Sullivans and the story of the Nylans come together to form the story of the Ryans in the movie Saving Private Ryan. Wow. I can't imagine what that would be like to receive telegrams like that. I mean, that is such a, any loss is horrible, but if you think of losing five brothers at the same time. Yeah, I agree with you because I love to meditate on this idea of how times today are so very, very different. The wars that we fight today are wars that are characterized by significantly lower loss. You have, the United States now has 50 years of wars that are fought with relatively light casualties and with effectively no interruption of the civilian economy. So it's possible to be an American living during a time of war from 1969 to present. There's a war being fought and you can live your life without experiencing any effect from that war. It's possible to live in the United States today without knowing anyone currently serving in the United States military. In other words, the experience of the modern era has insulated us from a powerful truism, the experience, the American home front experience in World War II, and that is that almost every single family in this country during that conflict, they experienced loss on some level. It was either a husband, brother, father, or son, or it was someone who was a part of your extended family, or the husband, brother, father, son of the next door neighbor. To some level, I don't believe anyone in this country was not affected by loss during the Second World War. That's something that Americans here in the 21st century, I believe that we have to struggle to attempt to empathize with that and to comprehend that. There are wars going on right now that don't affect us back here in the United States. We had people killed in action last week. I'm trying not to be cynical, but it gets, I believe, uh, a passing mention in the news cycle, only to be buried quickly by the other palace intrigues and high drama that goes on on a daily basis in this country. I mention the point only because I, I spend most of my time trying to comprehend as best I can the American experience in World War II, and the American experience of conflict today is completely different. Because it's possible to live your life today being totally detached from the fact that the United States is fighting a war. Yeah, you have to put yourself in a different mindset in order to really understand the time back then. Everyone was affected to some extent. And if you didn't lose someone in your family or, or among your friends, you were affected by gas rationing, food rationing, or you were part of the wartime economy to some extent. Everyone, no one was overlooked in being affected by that conflict. And I believe that Saving Private Ryan addresses that subject powerfully by creating the, the fictional Ryan family based on the Nylans and, and inspired partly by the Sullivans. Speaking of the, the characters there, I'm curious about some of the other characters that we see in the movie. You mentioned Captain John Miller, Tom Hanks's character, uh, being based on a few different people, but there are eight men in the squad that are sent out to find Ryan. There is Captain John Miller. Then there's Sergeant Horvath. There's Private Ryben, Private Jackson, Private Mellish, Private Caparzo, and the T4 medic Wade and Corporal Upham. Are those characters based on real people? I would say they're influenced by real people to certain extents. For example, in the film, the BAR gunner, Private Ryben, not Ryan, but Ryben, Ryben has painted on the back of his Model 1941 field jacket the words, I think it says Brooklyn, New York, USA. And that was partly inspired by a man who actually fought on June 6th and survived the day, uh, the late Harold Baumgarten, who painted a big Star of David on the back of his jacket and put Brooklyn, USA on it. In reading Stephen Ambrose's book, Robert wrote at, and I believe Mr. Spielberg had noticed it as well, had noticed that in the Baumgarten story that there was that painted on there. So there are elements of these characters that draw inspiration from people who actually lived. And then I should just mention that it's an interesting series of choices that they chose to represent the American melting pot in our 
primary cast of characters in Private Ryan. They also chose to provide some, to serve certain Hollywood war movie tropes in that you've got a Jewish guy and you've got an Italian and you've got a guy that's a mild mannered school teacher. And then you've, you've got guys that are kind of at each other's throats, but they'll, they'll risk their lives to save each other in combat. It's, those are some core Hollywood war movie tropes in and of themselves. And then you've got, uh, since we're talking about Private Ryben, the BAR gunner, you've got the wisecracking loudmouth, which is something that I, I mean, you can recognize that same character in just about every war movie that's ever been made to, cert- to a certain extent. And so this core group of U.S. Army Rangers with Corporal Upham, the clerk typist thrown in, the unlikely character among Rangers, none of whom look very Ranger, in my opinion, but whatever. They're all serving some standard Hollywood tropes about characterization, and they're also simultaneously partially inspired by actual events, by actual characters who lived as a part of a D-Day invasion. Hmm. So again, similar to the opening sequence, we have characters that are essentially composite characters that are trying to capture the essence of what it might have been like, not necessarily these this was a, an actual squad of soldiers that were tasked to do this actual thing right because the process of compositing those characters gives the filmmaker so much more freedom because if you try to tell the actual story you will get mired down endlessly in actuality and being held to people holding up the ruler of historical authenticity against your story and that's why i respect the filmmaker's decision to create a fictitious storyline that's inspired by actual events. Well, there's two events I want to ask you about, and this is after the squad makes their way to Newville in search of Private Ryan. The first is Vin Diesel's character when Private Caparzo, he's hit by a sniper, and then Barry Jack, uh, sorry, Barry Pepper's character, Private Jackson, he sneaks around to get an angle on the German sniper and We can see from the German's perspective, we see him looking for the American soldiers among the rubble, and he sees Private Jackson's rifle just in time to see him fire, and the shot goes right through the German sniper's scope and hits him in the eye. And that's one. And then the other event is when Paul Giamatti's character, Sergeant Hill, he's sitting down to try to get something out of his boot, and he accidentally knocks over a board, hits a brick wall, knocks down the entire wall, and then, surprise, there's a room full of German soldiers there. They're yelling at each other back and forth before then the Germans are shot by Ted Danson's version of Captain Hamill and some other soldiers there. Both of those events, to me, when I was watching this, it just seemed like these are movie moments that could never have actually happened. It's seemingly impossible shot. And then a surprise stalemate between two groups of enemy soldiers on either sides of the wall. Are there any stories of things like that actually happening? There are a few instances of our troops and their troops being hopelessly mixed in together. I'm thinking of a, of a story that was told to me by a veteran, the 507th Parachute Infantry 82nd Airborne Div- Division, who was trying to cross a hedgerow. And hedgerows in Normandy are very dense. They're, they're thick branches. There are a lot of thorns in hedgerows, making it quite difficult to push through, push your way through it. Pedro and this soldier named Johnny Marr was, he was a lieutenant in G Company 507. He was trying to push his way through a hedgerow. And as he was pushing his way through, coming from the right side to the left side, there was a German trying to push through at the same spot from the left side to the right side. And the two of them met each other right in the middle of this hedgerow. I think of that sometimes because that provides the kind of combat tension that I think war movies love. They feed on that sort of a combat tension. The random moment where something like that happens as you see depicted with that moment in the film when Sergeant Hill tries to, he, I think he says he's got a burr in his boot and that's why he leans up against the wall to take his boot off. I giggle sometimes when I think about that cast, that cast is so wildly exceptional and great and weird ways. Ted Danson as an airborne officer, Ted Danson, who was, I don't know how old he was at the time, but he was too old to portray a U.S. Army airborne officer, but whatever. He may be a division commander, a regimental commander or a division commander, maybe, but certainly not a company commander. Nevertheless, Ted Danson plays the role very nicely, I think, that you've got him there with 
the person who I think is one of the finest living actors today, Paul Giamatti, who has this bit throwaway role. He's in there. I have to remind myself at times that Paul Giamatti was in Saving Private Ryan. And he doesn't really fit the form of your average airborne infantryman. He looks a little bit too well served at the dinner table to, to fit that role. But then again, almost all of them kind of do in the movie. Nevertheless, Jamadi's good. Danson's good. It's all weird. The whole scene, it, it provides something that Spielberg needs. I mean, there's, there's literally a formula to making the perfect action film. And I don't know that it's fair to describe Private Ryan as just being a pure action film. It's more than that somehow. It's suspense. It's action. It's drama. It's a different genre than just your standard action movie. The cornerstone that we always point point to as perfection in action filmmaking is the movie Aliens, the sequel from 1986. And there's pacing to the way that you deliver action within that formula. And you can see how in Private Ryan, they were living according to that formula, where you open with a bang with the big Omaha Beach scene, then you pull back and you begin the process of exposition. You begin laying out your story, and then and you lay out what you need. So you divide a movie into three things, and the beginning presents what's needed, what has to happen. The center point provides tension and drama, and you get you see that clearly in Private Ryan, and the scene we're discussing right now fits into that center phase when drama is needed, and it gives you a nice, big, fat battle sequence that's totally different than the opening battle sequence of the movie. And it's also showing you how combat in Normandy is often at close quarters, that the quality and character of that combat is often under unpredictable circumstances, the evidence of which is the Paul Giamatti moment when the wall collapses and there are Germans on the other side. We're now at the point where I have to address the elephant in the room because you mentioned the Barry Pepper sniper sequence where the bullet comes through his rifle scope, which is based in fact, it's based in something that reportedly happened although it didn't happen during the Second World War. That is a story that is well-remembered from a sniper versus sniper duel that occurred in Vietnam. There was a sniper by the name of Carlos Hathcock who wrote a book called Marine Sniper, and Hathcock related that exact story of, of being stalked by an opposing North Vietnamese sniper who might have been a Russian sniper, it's just never entirely clear, but he's being stalked by an opponent sniper and he catches a glint off of his sniper scope. He fires a shot. It travels right down the scope tube and strikes the uh, opponent sniper through his eye socket. So they borrowed something from Vietnam to make that moment in a World War II movie. Wow. I would have just assumed it was completely made up. No, it's not. There are some questions about whether or not it actually happened the way that it was reported. I, can, I read Carlos Hathcock's book when I was a kid. And I loved it, and I don't want to question anything that that man wrote. But the problem with the Jackson character in Private Ryan is that there's a, it's believed that it would be a one-in-a-million shot for the bullet's trajectory to align perfectly with that scope tube. And also, glass decelerates bullets very effectively. It, glass, particularly thin glass, is not good at stopping them but it's really good at decelerating bullets. And so there's a lingering question about whether or not a bullet would be able to travel down the entire length of this tube of a sniper scope with objectives and ocular eyepieces in it. I would just refer anybody listening to have a look at Mythbusters tested this twice as one of the cooler episodes of Mythbusters. And their conclusion was the bullet couldn't get all the way through a sniper scope. Who knows whether or not those circumstances played themselves out in Har Carlos Hathcock's experience. That's less important. What I think is important to this discussion, though, is to say that incident is based on something that happened in Vietnam. And I now have to address this issue of the sniper in Private Ryan. Because Barry Pepper's character, Jackson, is a complete abuse and a misrepresentation on every level of the way that snipers functioned within the United States Army in the European theater of operations during the Second World War. And in addition to that, he's carrying effectively a Frankenstein of a rifle that did not actually exist during World War II. 
so <laughs> there really w- would not have been a way that he could have shot that because the rifle didn't exist to begin with. <laughs> right. Well, Jackson's rifle and Private Ryan is the perfect metaphor for Private Ryan itself because the rifle kind of exists, but it doesn't exist in the way that it's depicted in the movie, and it doesn't function the way that it's depicted as functioning in the movie. First of all, the U.S. military really didn't have a formal sniper program during World War II. Snipers were treated more of, as a squad-designated marksman more than anything, with a, a level of informality that you didn't see during World War I. During World War I, we had actual sniper training. And we dissolved all of that sniper training in the interwar period. And when World War II started, we didn't actually create a sniper program. And that didn't really even exist until Vietnam. We had sniper rifles, yes. But we didn't have a formal program during by which we trained people to be these precise marksmen as they're depicted in Private Ryan. But all the rifle did was provide a tool that was capable of delivering improved levels of rifle marksmanship. Now, onto the rifle. So the way that the rifle is depicted in the movie for most of the scenes, because if you look closely in the movie, you will see the Jackson character carrying two different rifles with two different scopes. There's basically one continuity error. I think my, maybe even two, two moments where they show him carrying a different rifle. And I think that's just a little continuity error in the film. So that's not really an issue. That's depicting him carrying the model 1903A4 sniper rifle, which existed during World War II and was used by the U.S. Army, but it depicts him using it with an M82 scope. That scope was not used by the U.S. Army during World War II. But that's the rifle that only shows up twice that I can think of during the movie. The scope that is on the rifle in 90% of the shots of the movie is the inertial 8 power scope, which was not used by the United States Army during the Second World War. It was used by the United States Marine Corps in the Pacific Theater of Operations only. And then when it was used by the Marine Corps, it was used on a totally different version of the 1903 rifle. So the 1903 rifle was adopted by U.S. military forces in the year 1903. It served through World War I. It served, importantly, throughout World War II, and it had a big role on D-Day. The Marine Corps and the Army used that as their platform for sniper rifles, but the two guns were quite a bit different. They used different scopes, first and foremost. And the Army version was different, just the rifle, not even talking about the scope. The Army's rifle was quite a bit different than the Marine Corps' rifle. And the Army's rifle used a totally different scope. And the the right the Army scope was the M73B1, which was only a four-power scope. It was a, a little bit weak in terms of magnification. The scope tube itself is pretty modest in dimension. I think it's one inch in diameter overall. It has an ocular eyepiece where you would look through, but it doesn't have the objective eyepiece is not bigger. Whereas the Marine Corps version, there's a big long objective eyepiece on the scope, and it looks gratuitously a lot more like a powerful sniper scope. And my understanding is that on the set, when they brought out an actual version of the U.S. Army's in 1903 A4 sniper rifle equipped with the appropriate and correct M73B1 scope that apparently Mr. Spielberg looked at it and went, that doesn't look very much like a sniper rifle. They looked at some photographs and that he saw the Marine Corps version, which is the 1903 rifle equipped with the eight power Unertal scope. And he went, that's a sniper rifle. Can't we get that scope? And so they took that scope, put it on the army version of the sniper rifle which was for the record different than the marine corps version of the sniper rifle and that's the scope that you see jackson hunting and shooting with throughout the movie except for two occasions that i caught and that is of course a version of the o3 sniper rifle that did not exist at all anywhere during the second world war and the scope that he's using is something that did not exist being used by U.S. Army forces in the European theater of operations during the Second World War. So, for the keen-eyed student of World War II history and small arms and things like that, the Jackson character is something you kind of have to shrug your shoulders and just learn to live with, because he's wielding this rifle that is a fantasy. And then, 
come on, guys. Left-handed sniper in World War II? That's not the way the world worked 75 years ago. If you were a left-handed shooter 75 years ago and you entered the army, you suddenly overnight became a right-handed shooter. They really didn't provide accommodations for people shooting left-handed, but you've got Jackson there with a sniper rifle that didn't exist during World War II, shooting it as a left-handed marksman. And so those are little bumps in the road of authenticity that create heartburn for the purest of World War II history. I loved what you said where like, it's just a great example of the movie overall. It's, it's all a composite, everything kind of thrown together. And that character is just a great, <laughs> it just continues the tradition. <laughs> yeah, it's based on a true story, but it's not a true story. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shut up. Boy. I love the sniper rifle thing. I like the fact that they were at least paying attention enough to depict the diversity of weapons, arming everyone. So the, within the squad of Rangers, to include them, the clerk type and stuff, them that's tagging along. You've got the diversity of firepower represented. And then when you bring in, like, when the Matt Damon Ryan character comes in, the 101st Airborne Division paratroopers are brought in. You see another weapon to come in, and that's the 1919 30 caliber machine gun. In other words, you're seeing this diversity of the firearms that were used by U.S. forces on D-Day. And I kind of like that because I find that a lot, of, a large number of the people that come on my tours, for example, that they imagine that all Americans landed on June 6th carrying the M1 eight-shot rifle and that everybody fought with that. But in Private Ryan, instead, you get, you have someone with a sniper rifle, albeit wrong. You have Sergeant Horvath carrying the M1 carbine, although the sergeant probably would have carried something different. You've got Captain Miller carrying the M1A1 Thompson submachine gun. You've got Ryben carrying the M1918A2 Browning automatic rifle. And then you have, is it three men armed with the M1 rifle? You've got Caparzo, Upham's carrying an M1 rifle, and then Mellish is carrying an M1 rifle. And I like the fact that they're representing the diversity of firearms that were being used during the era of, of the D-Day invasion. I just wish that Captain Miller and Sergeant Horvath had switched weapons because you would typically see an officer carrying the M1 carbine and you would typically see a technical sergeant carrying the Thompson submachine gun. Really? Why is that? It's just basically the way that the TO and the table of organization and equipment for U.S. Army fighting units in the European theater, it authorized who would carry what weapon, and it differed according to the type of unit you were in, whether you were an infantry unit or a supply unit or, for example, a ranger unit. And it typically authorized officers in ground units, non-airborne, carrying the M1 carbine. But you have Tom Hanks's character, John Miller, carrying the Thompson, and then the Sergeant Horvath character armed with the Thompson. I go ahead. No, Horvath is carrying the carbine. Miller is carrying the Thompson. Huh, that's interesting. I would never have thought about who's carrying what and whether or not that would have been correct or not. I do like that you pointed out the diversity there. Yeah, I absolutely love the fact that the movie did that. Because, and if there is one larger point that I could make about Saving Private Ryan, that is that I believe that it is, to date, the greatest achievement in the authentic presentation of a World War II subject. I'm not saying that the movie's perfect. I'm not even saying that it's excellent. It's got lots of problems, but it's the best that I've seen yet. End of the day, it is still a movie. It's not a documentary. So you're never going to have something that's going to be 100% authentic. That's not what movies are. Right, and I believe that what they did achieve in that film in terms of authenticity was on such a higher plane than movies that were around it, that came before it, that came after it. I think that what they achieved in terms of authenticity spoke powerfully to a certain audience of people that the world of World War II reenacting basically, it basically came alive after that movie was released. And I think it's because there were people that appreciated the effort that they put into creating an authenticity that you haven't seen in previous films. And that is, I have to acknowledge respectfully the fact that Mr. Spielberg, he turns over issues of authenticity to someone in the film business that, that, is, that has a pretty good track record of delivering authenticity. And that's uh, Captain Dale Dye. He was in charge of training the actors. He was in charge of um, helping create the atmosphere of authenticity that 
generally accompanies the film. And while that atmosphere is not perfect, it's pretty darn good. And I think that the, the goodness of that uh, created a lot of enthusiasm among, among a younger audience that probably would not have been reached by World War II history otherwise. Now, there are a lot of iconic scenes from the movie, but I want to ask you about one of the scenes that really stood out to me, and that was the dog tag scene. The men in the squad are given a bag of dog tags to see if Ryan's name is in there. And we see the men sitting down. They start going through them. Before long, they're joking around and almost being playful about it as they're going through the dog tags. And then meanwhile, you can see other members of the Airborne are watching on. And it's Wade, the medic, who stops the other men. He reminds them they're not poker chip. Each dog tag represents a fallen comrade in arms. And this scene really stood out to me because I saw it as a a turning point. You could clearly see that these soldiers were becoming or already were desensitized to the events that were going on around them as they're joking around with these dog tags. I can't help but think maybe just you know a few days earlier before D-Day, they might have had a very different reaction to sifting through a bag of dog tags. And it kind of shows how the events that they went through in those few days changed them as people. Was this sort of desensitization common among soldiers in the days after D-Day? I believe that it was. And I've also, although I've not been in the military, I, I feel like I have a, an understanding of it to a certain level in that I have seen how gallows humor typically um, accompanies military units as they experience combat and that the deeper they get into it, the the more the gallows humor tends to come out. And that scene does something very powerful in that it humanizes the loss in combat on June 6, 1944. And it also sets the stage for this, this daunting task of trying to find one person I could sidetrack for one quick moment, I would say that if that scene had been turned over to a lesser actor, I think the scene would have fallen over flat. I spent a lot of time trying to to figure out who's the best actor in this film, Saving Private Ryan, and I believe it might actually be Giovanni Ribisi playing Wade the Medic. Because in that scene, he, he just expresses subtlety in the way that he realizes that the guys are laughing and joking a little bit too much, and that they're being a little inappropriate for the circumstances and the way that he rushes over and he snatches it from him. I just feel like his acting performance in that scene is excellent. I feel like his acting performance in the entire movie is excellence in acting. And he's just a really good actor. I really felt like he brought that scene to life in Private Ryan. Although the scene is completely historically inaccurate on every level and it really gets under my skin and drives me nuts. <laughs> like I, <laughs> that was a big turn there. <laughs> <laughs> was wasn't it you can see how conflicted i am about this film because it's so great and at the same time i'm like uh where would you ever have one guy that just like i've got 50 dog tags in this bag of people i've just been picking up over the last few days oh yeah the pilot i think it was was the one that that threw him the bag the glider pilot yeah and he's like yeah here's here are a bunch of dog tags there was a general order in place that uh, for combat casualties you would not separate the dog tags from the casualties because if you, the moment everyone has two dog tags, but this was before the military was practicing this, this tradition of wearing one around your neck and one tied to the laces of your boots. That's a Vietnam thing, not a World War II thing. So everyone had two tags suspended from the chain around their neck. You didn't separate the tags from the body. And that's because those tags served a very specific purpose and that those tags guaranteed that when the unit that came in that was responsible from the point that you were, you were killed on the battlefield, from that point forward, another unit was responsible for you. The unit you were assigned to up to your death, that unit was, in, was responsible for you while you were alive. And if you were killed, they were responsible for processing some paperwork about you. But your body then became fell into the responsibility of mortuary services and graves registration units. And those units had to collect remains, identify remains, and then keep the identification with those remains. And in order to do that, 
you had to have both tags with the remains. There were extenuating circumstances. There were times when, when human bodies were so shattered as through the use of modern weapons that you no longer had a neck for the dog tag to hang from, or you had body parts that were separated from the whole. And under those circumstances, yes, you would lose track of the tags. But when you had a complete set of remains, the tags, both tags, stayed with those remains. And that's why that scene makes me kind of roll my eyes a little bit, because I can see how that scene gave them a moment of tension in the story that they needed. But I also have to go, they would, that would never happen. Those tags had to stay with the bodies because they stayed with the bodies and the Graves reg Registration Mortuary Services guys then knew what to do with the body and to identify that body. With those divisions basically following the front lines, or that is just a, a morbid job, but it's a, a massive one to keep track of all that. I can't imagine the nightmares that those men must have had after the war. Oh, I can't. I mean, yeah. Yeah, the men whose jobs it was to collect casualties on the battlefield, take them to a central point where they were being buried, and collect up often incomplete sets of remains. That must have been traumatizing. And there's been a great deal written about that experience in the last few years. And that's all extremely important and compelling. And uh, in, in my personal work on one story that I've dealt with, I've had to investigate what happened with a specific graves registration unit and how they, after the fact, recovered the remains of men who were killed in action. And there's footage associated with it. There's footage of the men of the 603rd Quartermaster Graves Registration Company collecting bodies that had been temporarily buried and reburying them. And the footage, I can barely watch the footage. It's so gruesome. And that was the everyday experience of uniformed service in the United States Army for the men of these units. And, and, and I should just throw in one plug for them. I spent a lot of time tracking people who were killed in Normandy, tracking how they were killed, where they were killed, and where they ended up buried. And what overwhelms me is that the men from the quartermaster graves registration companies and the mortuary services companies, those men carried out what I consider to be an extremely challenging mission, and they carried it out in an analog era of forms with carbon paper and in triple kit. And in an era with no digital assistance whatsoever. And they carried out that job with so much accuracy that in studying this subject intensely for about 20 years now, I have found very few mistakes. And I think all respect needs to be given to the men who picked up our war dead, made sure that they were identified and made sure that they had a proper burial. Wow. Yeah. That's a side of it that I had never thought about before. And that's it's so great that that subject makes its way into the grand narrative of Saving Private Ryan. And that's almost, I hate to criticize the moment because it at least addresses the subject. If the subject made it into Private Ryan, that's basically a guarantee that here we are more than 20 years later, people are still going to be talking about it because that's what blows me away about this movie. I remember when I first started tour guiding, I remember thinking like 15 years ago, I remember, I remember thinking that, yeah, I think interest is probably going to begin fading, and, and I certainly won't be able to um, find much of a livelihood in leading tours to Normandy, certainly not after about 2002, 2003. And here I am, almost a decade later, and there's more interest now than there was 10 years ago. I think Saving Private Ryan is to blame for a lot of that. And to think. And to think, yeah. And but at the same time, it's a conflict. <laughs> yeah, that movie did more than any book that has ever been written, any book that I will ever write, any book that smarter people than me will ever write. That movie did more than any of us ever could to ensure the continuing popularity of that subject. I want to shift a little bit to some of the geographical side because we're given some names in the movie, but we never get a lot of geographical context about the squad's search for Private Ryan. They start on Omaha Beach, and then from there they head to what the movie says is behind enemy lines to Newville, where the dog tag scene was. 
I did a, a look on online and as the crow flies, it's about 21 miles or 34 kilometers between those two locations. And then from there, they go to Ramel, which is on uh, the Merderet River. And that's another four miles or six and a half kilometers. Now, since the movie makes multiple mentions that Newville is behind enemy lines, and that was their first destination, I can only assume that all of this is taking place behind enemy lines the entire time. Of course, there's already other soldiers. We mentioned the Airborne who were already at Newville. So it's not like this rescue squad is the only allied soldiers behind enemy lines. But can you give us a little more geographical context about where the German lines were in relation to these places that we see referenced in the movie? Sure. The reason that they choose Nuvin for the film, um, it's they're, what they're doing is they're giving a nod to the town Nuville au plan, which is the place where Bob Nyland was killed on June 6th. And so they're referencing that, which brings us a little bit of a, com- a point of convergence with the story, the true story upon which the, the fictional story is based. But Neuville is to the north and west of St. Mariglis. And so Neuville, as you have already calculated, is pretty far from Omaha Beach. It is clo- much, much closer to Utah Beach. It's only about 10 miles inland from Utah Beach, maybe a little more, maybe like 11 miles inland from Utah Beach. Uh, but it is not located conveniently close to Omaha which is why you have to suspend reality a little bit just to go with what Steven Spielberg and Robert Rodat want you to go with here, and that is that this group of rangers that land on Omaha Beach at Dog Green Sector are then sent far behind the lines behind Utah Beach to look for a missing paratroop. Because the practical reality at work here is that this would have been a physical impossibility. The reason I say that is that between Omaha and Utah, there's this one town called Carentan. Carentan was the point at which the, the U.S. Army 5th Corps landing on Omaha and the U.S. Army 7th Corps landing on Utah were supposed to come together. They were supposed to come together late in the day on June 6th, maybe on June 7th. They did not come together for almost a week. It took time. That was not part of the plan, but it's not until the 101st Airborne Division captures Carentan. It's not even until after that, actually. And that happens on June 11th. It's not until after June 11th that Omaha Beach and Utah Beach are able to link up on their flanks. So for a group of rangers who landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day to make their way to the area, the drop zone area behind Utah Beach, I would challenge is a physical impossibility because it would have caused, it would have called for them to not go straight as the crow flies 20 miles, 20 miles, but more like 30 miles circuitously following terrain because the terrain in the area between Omaha and Utah is the area where there it's a, it's a tributary area for several river systems. In fact, the Dug River, the Veer River, the Tote River, those are all flowing into the English Channel in the area between Utah and Omaha. So these guys would have not only had to have gone through enemy territory, but they would have had to have covered enemy territory, crossing rivers, going well out of their way to go um, to move across flooded marsh areas because the Germans had seen to it that there was flooding that was beyond just the normal seasonal flooding in the area in the tributary, the mouth area of the Veer, the Toet, and the Duv. And those men would then have had to have made their way without contacting either the enemy or uh, other Americans for mile after mile after mile. And as we know from the film, they do contact other Americans and they do contact the enemy. But I believe it would have been physically impossible for them to move from the area behind Omaha to the drop zone area inland from Utah Beach. (laughs) <laughs> that helps a lot. Put that into a little more perspective. Again, it sounds like it was a a story decision. Yeah, it's a, it's a storytelling decision, as was the creation of the fictional village Ramel. That is a village that does not exist. That village was created just for the purposes of storytelling. And that what happens in that village is, to an extent, based on two, maybe three actual events. 
Uh, but there were no 101st Airborne Division, Division paratroopers that were sent to babysit a bridge at a village called Ramel because there was no and is no village of Ramel in Normandy. I respect the fact that they wanted to tell a story. They wanted that story to be a D-Day story. They wanted to do it with a level of authenticity that was unprecedented. And they did all of that. But to get there, they had to massage the actuality of the D-Day invasion. And they had to create a few things. And they had they ended up, I think, unintentionally distorting a few things. Like I've I've not gotten down in the weeds of picking out minor little authenticity details like how Spielberg had beach obstacles on Omaha Beach backwards. They were facing the wrong way. They were facing out to the water when they're supposed to be facing the bluff. I'm not I'm not carping on minor issues like that. And I mean, I know I mentioned the bunker and how the bunker on Omaha Beach was wrong, but there are going to be little unintentional authenticity slip-ups from time to time in a film. Uh, but then they also had to make some major decisions where they consciously departed from the actuality of the historical record. And they certainly did that with the creation of the fictional village, Ramel. Well, since you mentioned that, because that was something that I wanted to ask, because according to the movie, that's, again, where they find Private Ryan. And Captain Miller gives him the bad news about his brothers, but then... Ryan, Matt Damon plays Private Ryan, and he refuses to leave. He says something to the effect of, you can tell my mother that when you found me, I was here and with the only brothers I have left. There's no way I'm abandoning this bridge. And then we find out from the man in charge, Corporal Henderson, that Allied planes from the 82nd took out all the bridges across the Mare except for two of them. One of them at Valone, and then the other one that they're at now. And their orders are to defend that bridge at all costs. So we're left with Captain Miller making the decision that they're going to keep the squad there in order to help hold the bridge and then take Ryan back afterwards is the assumption. But you mentioned that there were possibly a couple of stories that this was based on. Yeah, and I would say that they androgynously kind of inform what's going on with Ramel and the 101st Airborne Division troopers. They borrow a little bit from an action that the 82nd Airborne Division is involved in, where there is a bridge, and it is over the Mediterranean River, and it's a place that's called Lafayette. And that is the 82nd Airborne Division's primary battle for the first three days of the invasion from June 6th all the way through the afternoon of June 9th. The 82nd Airborne Division is struggling with German units uh, in the vicinity of um, the Mediterranean River crossing site at Lafayette. So it's sort of based on that, where there's an old 1840s stone bridge. And then also on another story of a Mediterranean River crossing that was just about three miles south of there at a place called Chef du Pont. And interestingly, Private Ryan, you can, when you read a little bit about Lafayette and Chef du Pont, you can, it all start, suddenly starts to make sense how Robert wrote that was inspired by those two stories in addition to another story that I'll get into later if you want me to. But he's inspired by Lafayette and Chef Dupont to a certain extent. There is a, there's a moment at Chef Dupont that makes its way into Saving Private Ryan powerfully where a battalion commander in the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division, a man named Edwin Osberg, they move down and they're ordered to go and capture this bridge intact. So they move through the town Chef Dupont the Mare River Bridge, a stone bridge, is just south of town. Lieutenant Colonel Osberg runs out onto the bridge, and when he's, just as he's about to put his foot down on the bridge, he's shot. He falls to the ground, rolls off the bridge, and splashes into the water, which is something that we see in the closing scene, the climactic battle scene in Ramel and Saving Brett Ryan. But then... The next highest ranking officer takes over, and he was a friend of mine, a person I knew quite well. His name was Roy Creek, and Roy Creek was the E Company commander of the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, and Captain Creek took over the fight for the bridge at Chicktepont, and he takes the bridge. He has a small force. He receives a note late in the day on June 6th instructing him to hold the bridge at Chef Dupont, instructs him to specifically hold at all costs. And I find that Roy Creek's story from Chef Dupont, to an extent, inspires the imaginary story 
of the 101st Airborne Division paratroopers at the fictitious village of the Mill on the Midway. Not to shift movies, but there's the bridge in the longest day that they have to hold as well. And I I don't remember the exact line, but it's um, hold until relieved or something like that. Is that the same story? And longest day, when you hear hold until relieved, hold until relieved, that's Pegasus Bridge over the Conk Canal in the Sword Beach area. Okay, so not related at all with this story there. Not really, but I think maybe philosophically and spiritually it may have contributed some uh, inspiration to Robert Rodak. Well, yeah, I, I guess since it's a, a fictional story and, and Saving Private Ryan, I guess there can be a lot of different uh, inspirations there. Yeah, and uh, to me, what it looks like is Rodak, in a commendable way, I'm not criticizing him, in a commendable way, he treated the broad story of D-Day as like a cafeteria. You can't cram it all into one movie. There's no way to do it. That movie would be 100 hours long and nobody would sit through it. Uh, so he had to pick and choose. And as he went down the cafeteria line, he picked, I'll take a little bit of Lafayette. I'll take a little bit of Chef Pont. I'll take a little bit of Rangers on Omaha Beach. I'll take a little bit of George Taylor on Omaha Beach. I'll take a little bit of Jimmy Monteith on Omaha Beach. And he picks and chooses all of these things to create a story. And his objective was not to create a documentary that provided a factual representation of the D-Day invasion. His objective was to create a good story, and I think he succeeded. Yeah. Would the strategy that they have in the movie Around the Bridge be correct, though, that they were a vital part of the war effort to, to maintain those or to keep them from being destroyed by the enemy? This is where it gets a little weird. Yes and no. Again, the annoying historian qualified answer. Yes, and so far as the two bridge crossing sites of the Mer de Ray, Lafayette and Chef de Paul are elevated to an incredible level of importance after June 6th. And that's because of the fact, particularly Lafayette, and that's because of the fact that the Germans had purposely exacerbated seasonal flooding by manipulating locks on the Vera River, the Tote River, and the Dove River. By manipulating these locks, they tracked, they trapped a lot of water in the interior of the Cochinchin Peninsula, which is where the Airborne Force landed on D-Day, the American Airborne Force. And that trap water created a big lake where there normally was not a lake. And by big lake, I mean big. I mean, it is almost 10 miles wide from top to bottom. At a couple of places, it's, it's two and three miles across. But at one critical point, at Lafayette, the flooded area was only about 700 meters wide where there was the bridge over the river and then a raised roadway called a causeway leading from the east side of the flooded area to the west side of the flooded area. And from the force landing on Utah Beach, the U.S. Army 7th Corps, composed of multiple divisions, a force of over 50,000 men, that force was to land on Utah Beach, push into the interior, and continue pushing westward all the way across the peninsula, the, pen the Cotentin Peninsula, by securing the peninsula, by cutting off the peninsula, it would then become possible for the U.S. 7th Corps to engage in maneuver warfare with four divisions that would then push from the south to the north to envelop and capture the port city at Cherbourg from its landward approaches. That was the overall big picture core level strategy. And in order to carry out that strategy, the Corps had to land all of its men and vehicles on Utah Beach, and then they had to move westward. And in order to complete that westward movement, they had to get across this flooded area. And there was really only one good place to get across that flooded area, and that was at Lafayette. Which is why the Battle of Lafayette that unfolds on June 9, 1944, is climactic and important because it opens up that artery. What was happening in the days before June 9 was effectively a building and growing traffic jam. Think of a traffic jam that's being counterattacked by the enemy. That's what was happening. And then the 82nd Airborne was given the task of punching through, recapturing the bridge and causeway, and therefore opening up a route for ground forces to move westward, which was the overall strategy of 7th Corps in the aftermath of the landings. So the stakes for the battle 
fought by the 82nd Airborne Division on June 9th at LaPierre are extremely high. They carry the field of battle. They are victorious. They open up the LaPierre Causeway, and those forces begin moving westward in the aftermath of that victory. And so if we assume that Robert Rodat based part of the fictional battle at Ramel on what actually happened at LaPierre, you could say, you could elevate the importance of that site to the highest level by saying, if we don't hold this bridge and the enemy takes it, it changes the war. It's those sort of melodramatic terms typically accompany motion pictures. And it's a little bit of a Hollywood goofy thing to see moments like that elevated to these incredibly important terms. And it's a little bit goofy in Hollywood to see like the lowest ranking people echoing these visions of grand strategy. But that happens a couple of times in Private Ryan. And I think it had to happen. Although it might be a little bit goofy and a little bit laughable. I think it had to happen because you had to have certain levels of character exposition. Like there's a moment where Tom Hanks is talking to Ted Danson and they're talking about Montgomery and how ah, Monty's stalled over there near Caen. And we have to get to Caen to get to Berlin. We have to get to Berlin to get to the big boat home. I think I'm quoting the movie correctly. And I find it a little bit peculiar that you would have two captains having these discussions of grand strategy. And also my big challenge to that idea would be how in the world would two U.S. Army captains know all the details of what's happening far away in the area around Caen? where the British are fighting. I think that they wouldn't. Maybe captains discussed grand strategy in down moments in Normandy, but I think they wouldn't have had like up-to-date current events in terms of what the British were experiencing around Caen. And by that same token, when you see the 101st Airborne Division paratroopers in the fictional town Ramel discussing how we have to hold this bridge, if the enemy takes this bridge, it's all over with. I'm not entirely convinced that the ground troops on the lowest possible level are having discussions of grand strategy. I think that their conversations were probably reflective of more immediate needs and more immediate concerns. Like, we'd ha- this is how much ammunition we have. This is how much food we have. Do we have communications established with anybody else? I think they would have been discussing that sort of thing rather than we can't let this bridge fall to the enemy or else the entire invasion is undermined. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because that is something I wanted to ask you about because in the movie, the whole plan to defend the bridge, they do, there's a mention where they talk about how they're low on weapons and low on ammo and they know the Germans are coming and they're going to come with tanks. And so according to the movie's side, uh, Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, suggests that they make sticky bombs. And of course, they have no idea what those are. So he has to explain that you take a sock, you cram it with as much comp B as it'll hold, coat it with axle grease, and then you throw it, it sticks to the tank, sticky bomb, it's their best bet to take off a tank tread. And so we see a mixture of that. We see Jackson with his <laughs> sniper rifle that we've talked about earlier. He's set up and there's a 30 caliber uh, machine guns that they use as well. And then, of course, there's hand-to-hand combat. How well do you think the movie did showing this strategy and this mix of weapons, even though the the bridge itself in the movie is fictional, but how well do you think it did showing that battle? Let me get the party pooper stuff out of the way first, and then I'll give it compliments. (laughs) First of all, Units of the American 101st and 82nd Airborne Division are not encountering Waffen SS Panzer Grenadiers in that area because this area is androgynously along the length of the Mare de Ray River. And I would just point out that there's no point during the fighting in Normandy where Waffen SS units engage American Airborne forces along the Mare de Ray. Doesn't happen. The 101st Airborne Division encounters uh, Panzer Grenadiers of the 17th SS in the area south of Carentan beginning on June 9th, but not up at the Mare de Ray River. That's just me being a party pooper. And then also, let's talk tanks for a second. Because what you see in the concluding climactic battle scene at Grimmel is an assault gun. Or really, it's not a, really an assault gun. It's actually a piece of self-propelled, self-propelled field artillery. You see a self-propelled field artillery vehicle, and you see a tank that is supposed to be a Tiger. And just for the record, that is a Soviet T-34 tank that has been modified to look like a German Tiger. 
It's not an actual German tiger. They just need a big tank, and there's really only one functioning tiger anywhere in the world, and that's in England, number 131, that was depicted in Fury. Uh, so they took a Soviet T-34, converted it to make it look like a tiger, and it's there present in the Rommel battle. Just for the record, Americans fighting in Normandy do not encounter a German tiger tank until the Mortain counteroffensive in August. So from June 4th until August, we don't encounter tigers. In fact, it's not until, I think, July 29th that we encounter a panther. It's not until like July 28th that we encounter a German Mark IV tank. I'm saying all of this because I think an important point for us to remember is that American forces, particularly American parachute infantry forces, do not encounter German-made battle tanks until late July. They encounter this special German vehicle that we call a Sturmgeschütze or Stug. We encounter those around St. Mary's in the afternoon on June 7th. We encounter them in a few other places, but that's not a tank. It's an assault gun. It doesn't have a 360-degree rotating turret, and it is capable of quite a bit less than a Tiger or a Panther or even a Mark IV, for that matter. And we're not seeing them. What we are seeing, though, in terms of German armored forces attacking American paratroopers shortly after the invasion, what we're seeing are German armored forces that are attacking American paratroopers with French-made tanks that were captured by the Germans in 1940. In fact, there's a, a tank battle on the Lafayette Causeway in the afternoon on June 6th. And that tank battle consists of one German-made Mark III tank and three French-made tanks being used by a German fighting battalion. The battalion was called Einhard der Panzer Ausbildung zum Abteilung, and it was a training and replacement battalion that was almost completely equipped with these French-made tanks. So there are no American paratroopers going jaw to jaw against the Tiger. It just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. It's a fantasy. It makes for a heck of a good scene, and it makes for a lot of tension, that whole tension associated with that. You know that moment in the movie where they show Ryben and Hanks, and they're in the hole, and the ground's shaking, and there's literally like rocks bouncing up and down from the rumbling of the approaching Tiger? That's suspenseful, and it's almost visceral. It's just too bad it didn't actually happen during b -Day or any of the days that came immediately thereafter. So Americans are experiencing uh, German fighting vehicles, German armored fighting vehicles, but they're not encountering the fr most frightening beast of them all, the German Tiger. So there's another license that the film takes with the reality of combat during the Normandy invasion. So the idea of the SS carrying out this coordinated infantry and armor assault against the village up on the Meridoray River, it's, that's all a fiction created just for the movie. And it's all based on, once again, a gumbo, a mixture of battles from different eras, er, eras of fighting in the European theater, from different locations across the European theater. It introduces some truths, and it introduces a lot of distortion and, and mythology. And just for the record, there was a sticky bomb during World War II. It doesn't end up looking like a stock with grease and Composition B stuff in it. Although the training manuals did have a chapter on improvised explosive devices where it instructed U.S. troops on how to create a bomb that was sort of like that, but not entirely. And again, another fiction that was designed to it was designed, I think, to recognize an American, a unique American spirit of, of being flexible, of being innovative, of working with what you got. And that is certainly a, a way that people tend to characterize the American army that fights in the European theater in World War II. Uh, but you don't really see a battle where tiger tanks come rumbling into the town with airborne infantrymen, and just for the record, airborne infantry is, by its very nature, light infantry. The airborne infantry with basically one anti-tank weapon, and that's it, because if, if you remember in the movie, the one anti-tank weapon they have is the one that was carried by, I think it was actually used by the, the Private Ryan character. It was a 
model M1A1 anti-tank rocket launcher, what we call the bazooka. So you're supposed to imagine this force of 101st Airborne Division paratroopers with a group of U.S. Army Rangers and then a 29th Division clerk type is thrown in on top of it. They have one anti-tank weapon and they're supposed to hold off this coordinated assault by Waffen SS Panzer Grenadiers supported by armor. There's a lot of fantasy going on in that scenario. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> I forgot to give it compliments. I should give you a compliment. One compliment that I think it deserves is that that scene is an intense combat scene, but it's got a totally different quality to the intense combat scene that comes at the beginning of the movie. It's an intense combat scene, but it's totally different. And I think it's, I mean, it had the first time I saw it, it had me on the edge of my seat. I mean, it's visceral, it's powerful. The hand to hand sequence is evocative. And I mean, it's stimulating in all of the negative ways. I mean, you really empathize with the Mellish character when he's trying, when he's engaged in hand to hand combat with this tough looking Waffen SS Panzer Grenadier that in, involves them beating each other and biting fingers off, and then ultimately the German bayonets the Mellish character. That's a powerful scene. And I think it's powerful and thought-provoking as well that as a part of the exposition of that scene, it also addresses the idea of someone who is traumatized by the experience of being in the middle of a battle because the Upham character is atomized by this battle that's going on around him. He's not ready for it, and he doesn't cope with it well. Because he hears Mellish screaming for his life just up the stairs. Upham's there with a loaded M1 rifle. He could go up and he could save Mellish. And he's so paralyzed by fear that he doesn't do it. And I think that is an interesting thing for the movie to have addressed. Because that is definitely something that is a part of the American experience of fighting in the European theater and combat in World War II. Because not everybody, but there were Americans who, when it came time for them to turn on their bravery in battle, some men were not capable of doing it. There are some people that in the face of combat, their instinct drove them to retreat. Whereas there are others who rise to the greatest levels of self-sacrificing courage that you could imagine. You hear all those stories about the heroic side and, and the people who do that, you know, where they, they rise to the challenge. Uh, but first time I saw Saving Private Ryan, that scene really stood out to me with with Upham and because it was one of the first times that it was like, well, yeah, not everybody's going to rise to that challenge. It's just there's not everybody can. And so I think that they addressed that really spoke volumes and, and told a completely different side in just those few moments. Yeah, that's, that's a subject I find myself talking about on my tours quite a lot. And just like you said. Not everybody is cut out for it. And consider what we, what the American military became, what it, it had become by 1944. And that is that it was a military force that was composed of a large number of people that volunteered, and then also a large number of people who did not volunteer, a large number of conscripts, people who were drafted into uniform. And among the draftees, I am fascinated by the way the um, U.S. Army draftee experience in World War II the volunteers are people who I think knew that they were cut out for it to begin with and then experienced basic training and experienced during combat. They were cut out for it. They had been gotten through that evolution. And then a large number of men are drafted to the U.S. Army, put in uniform. They go through accelerated basic training programs. They are delivered to fighting units in Europe. And sometimes they don't do well. You have the bookends of experience, you have the complete polar opposite in that I'm fascinated by the number of U.S. Army draftees who go to Europe and earn the Medal of Honor in some of the most amazing acts of bravery you can imagine. And then you also have men like, there was a man named Eddie Slovic, who was in the 28th Infantry Division, who was a draftee, and Slovic, once the Battle of the Bulge began, and there was disorder and chaos created by the German advance in the Battle of the Bulge. Slovic took the opportunity to desert his unit. He was ultimately found and was tried for desertion and was ultimately uh, executed by firing squad. The one and only U.S. Army uh, soldier who was executed for desertion during World War II. He was a draftee and he deserted his unit in Luxembourg. There was another U.S. Army soldier in Luxembourg named Deji Turner who was a draftee 
Ed, who by the time he got to Luxembourg for the Battle of the Bulge, he had already earned a bronze star. And as a draftee, he went on to earn the Medal of Honor and then was engaged in another act of absolutely incredible bravery when he was ultimately killed in a combat on February 7th, 1945. And he was a draftee. So when you when you assemble a citizen soldier army, and the, the American military ultimately becomes seven, 16 million people in uniform during World War II. Whenever you assemble a force of that scale and you get there by instituting a draft, some of them are going to be people that can handle it, and some of them are going to be people that cannot. And it interested me very much that the movie Saving Private Ryan addressed that very issue. Going back to the movie, despite taking heavy losses at the bridge, the Americans are able to hold back the German assault just long enough. All hope seems lost. Captain Miller is mortally wounded, and he's shooting at a tank with his pistol. And one of the shots results in a massive explosion. And then we see a P-51 fly over it, and they come out and take out the German tanks. Other reinforcements arrive, and they push back the rest of the German forces. But Captain Miller has been shot. Ryan makes it to him just before he dies. And holding him close, Miller tells Ryan two words, earn this. And then the movie takes us back to the beginning. We have the the elderly man in the cemetery from the beginning of the movie. And this is when we find out it's James Ryan. He's there with his family visiting Captain Miller's grave. He stands in front, says he never forgot what he said that day on the bridge. And... We're left with tears in our eyes as the movie comes to a close. Now, what I gathered from this was that James Ryan felt the pressure to live his life to the fullest because he came home when so many did not. Of course, in his case, there was a specific mission to save his life that cost the lives of others. Was this sort of survivor's guilt that we see in the movie something common among veterans who managed to make it home after the D-Day invasion when so many did not? I think it was. For my first and second books, I interviewed a couple hundred D-Day veterans, almost all of whom are gone now. Um, And they spoke to that regularly. In addition to that, I was raised in a household by a Vietnam veteran who spent two years, two tours of duty in Vietnam, and he was traumatized. And I was raised by a man who obviously felt survivor's guilt. Uh, My father's unit was attacked in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive at a place called Kuchi, right after my father had rotated out to go home. And his first sergeant, whom I'm named after, was killed. And I, I saw the way that my father felt guilt all the way until his life ended. And that guilt, I think, simultaneously tortured him. And then admonished him to live the fullest possible life that he could. And although he wasn't a survivor of D-Day or the Second World War, I feel like the experience of combat between these conflicts is the same. Yeah. I'm not a member of the military. My dad was in the Army, but I think it's just a great a great message overall. It still hit me, even though I'm not in the military. It's, it still hit me, like, you know, live live your life to the fullest because... You never know. You know, Dan, when that movie, when I sat there with the first time I watched it in Atlanta, Georgia, and when the credits rolled, I looked around and I was like, what the hell just happened in this theater? What? I did not, when I went into that movie, that was not what I expected. I did not expect a, an emotional drama. I did not expect the levels of authenticity, although they weren't perfect. They were great. And I certainly didn't expect a film where... If you pay close attention to that movie, establishing shot number one is a waving American flag. It fades up from credits to the southern flagpole, uh, the northern flagpole at the Normandy American Cemetery. And when I saw that, my first thought was like, waving American flag? What am, what's about to happen to me in this theater? And then two and a half hours later, I came out going, this is not what I expected. Because keep in mind the era of my Maybe I'm just unique in timing because my era of movie watching was the war movies that I got addicted to when I was young was stuff like Longest Day, stuff like Tora Tora Tora, Bridge Too Far, from an era when war movies were a bit different, but they were about to change. And then the movies that were new releases that dealt with World War II subject matter 
sequel movies like Big Red One, and then moved into the 1980s. And the movies that came out in the 1980s, really the one standout World War II movie in the 1980s for me is Memphis Bell. And Memphis Bell kind of, I believe, it wasn't celebratory um, and romanticized in the way that Private Ryan was. I felt like Memphis Bell was a little bit of a World War II Vietnam movie. And of course, in the 80s, that's when the big Vietnam movies were out. Uh, the biggest of them all, of course, Platoon, which I argue established an overall narrative about the experience of Vietnam that is completely distorted and, and not really factually accurate. Uh, but regardless of what I think about these movies, these movies had a quality of disenchantment and, and cynicism that you don't see in the movie Saving Private Ryan. When I sat down in the theater before the credits, before the theater lights dimmed that night, I was not expecting to go down the line of a movie that was going to be a little patriotic, a little triumphal. I didn't expect it to be quite as reflective. There are moments where it's about as subtle as a barn door, but then there are moments where it's pretty subtle and emotional. I did not expect the film that Steven Spielberg gave me. And if anything, I feel like the, the lasting popularity of Saving Private Ryan is because Steven, Steven Spielberg did not give us a Vietnam movie that was set in World War II. I wasn't expecting it to be as emotional as it ended up being. I thought they did a great job of showing the human side. It did. And I, I struggle with this because I, like every other historian out there, we're a dime a dozen. And we all have added ideas and screenplays that we're going to write and how we're going to make the next Saving Private Ryan and we're going to be responsible for it. And I often argue that it is not possible to match that, uh, that achievement. And here's why I think it's not possible. And I think it's not possible because of Steven Spielberg. That movie happened because Steven Spielberg wanted to make that movie. And people didn't tell Steven Spielberg how to make his movie. He made the movie he wanted to. So the man who brought us E.T. brought us the waving American flag and earned this. And I don't mean mention E.T. to be negative or cynical. I mention it because he clearly makes movies that want to pull at your heartstrings. And the movie Saving Private Ryan definitely did that. Definitely did. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Saving Private Ryan. I think one of the biggest takeaways that I've heard from people after seeing the movie and after our discussion is just how it visualizes what it must have been like during D-Day. But that leads us right into an even better way to visualize D-Day with your book called D-Day, A Photographic History of the Normandy Invasion. Can you share a little bit of information about your book and where someone can pick up a copy? Sure, yeah. The book was released just early, mid last year, for just in time for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. It's It features 450 photographs of the Normandy invasion, some familiar, some never been published before. What I sought to do in the book was to bring um, a greater level of specificity to captioning and explanation of where certain famous photographs were taken and what they depict. Uh, I also do a little bit of then and now photography, and I do a little bit of storytelling in the book as well. And it was a compilation of my experiences of having conducted interviews with hundreds of D-Day veterans and spent a lot of time around the subject and spent a lot of time in Normandy. And um, I'm just glad that it was re-released in time for the 75th anniversary. Uh, I think it is for the most part, the re-release is for the most part sold out now, but I see that copies are available on a a Amazon. You can find it on there. I'm the only Martin K. A. Morgan that has published books on Amazon.com. I'm proud of it. I like the book a lot. I, I look back on it as a positive moment. It didn't really burn the world down in terms of reaching people, and it wasn't a bestseller, but the economics of publishing in the 21st century are pretty complicated, and I'm just glad to have a book out. Thank you again so much for your time, Marty. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the honor of inviting me to be a part of the discussion, Dan. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Marty Morgan once again for coming on the show. 
If you want to get a visual look at the history of what happened on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944, go grab a copy of Marty's book called D-Day, A Photographic History of the Normandy Invasion. I'll make sure to add a link to that book and where you can learn more about Marty's other work in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, James Ryan was the only of the Ryan brothers to survive World War II. Number two, the battle at the bridge in Rommel did not happen. Number three, there was no use of flamethrowers on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with that last one. Number three, there was no use of flamethrowers on Omaha Beach on D-Day. That is true. As Marty explained, even though there were flamethrowers used during the war, they were not used on Omaha Beach. So that scene in the movie where we see a flamethrower taking out a German bunker, that did not happen. Oh, and Marty also let us know another reason that wouldn't have happened is because there were not any German bunkers like the one that we see in the movie on Omaha Beach. That brings us to number two. The battle at the bridge in Rommel did not happen. That is also true. And by being true, what I mean is that the battle at the bridge we see in Rommel, France during the movie did not happen because, as Marty explained, the city of Rommel does not exist. The river that they mentioned in the movie, the Mer de Ray, that is a real river. So it might seem like Rommel might be a real place, but it isn't. Instead, the battle that we see in the fictional city of Rommel over the real Mediterranean River was more of a composite of a number of other battles that Marty talked about. And the filmmakers picked different pieces of these different battles to put them together into a new fictional battle for the movie. That means the lie is number one. James Ryan was the only of the Ryan brothers to survive World War II. Marty explained that the Ryan family from the movie was completely fictional. Instead, their story was based on two stories that were very real. One was even mentioned very briefly in the movie, The Sullivan Brothers. The other, and the story that resembles the fictional Ryan brothers in the movie the closest, are the Nyland brothers. For the real Nyland brothers, two of the four brothers ended up surviving World War II. Although, for a while, everyone thought three of the four were killed, until it was found that one of the brothers, Edward, was still alive in a Japanese POW camp in Burma. That just about wraps up this episode. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. Now, I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm sharing this information. Maybe if you find out more about how much time, money, and effort goes into creating podcasts like mine, maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 45 hours to create and cost $6.99 in out-of-pocket expenses. Now, I got lucky on the out-of-pocket expenses because I already own the movie, but wow, that is a lot of hours to create this episode. I really hope you enjoyed the end result. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. So that does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about, nor does it include my ongoing costs. For example, the monthly podcast and website hosting costs. It doesn't account for any of the time outside of writing, researching, and producing this one episode. For example, once this episode goes live, there's social media and various marketing things that I'll have to do. And there's uh, updating the website, maintaining the website. There's updating software, maintaining software, maintaining computers, uh, that sort of thing. None of that is factored into that 45 hours. That 45 hours was just the creation of this one episode. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a little bonus, you'll get access to hours of exclusive content on the producer's feed. We're up to over 45 minisodes that talk about how completely fictional movies depict history. And 
even more exclusive content. It's all just a way of saying thank you for helping me keep the lights on here at Based on a True Story just a little longer. Now, if you're not able to support the show monetarily, no problem at all. I'm so happy that you've given me some of your precious time for the last couple hours, and I hope you've enjoyed this time together as much as I have. In the meantime, if you'd like to add to the story, hop onto the Based on a True Story Facebook group, or you can reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.